Welcome to the Symposium on the Ethics of Protest. Uh, we have three presenters, each of whom present, after which we'll have a Q&A. Uh, Jonathan Havercroft is an associate professor in the Department of Politics and uh, International Relations at the University of Southampton. Uh, he has published works on global order and anarchy and is the editor of the journal Global Constitutionalism. Uh, his paper, Why Is There No Just Riot Theory, won the 2021 British Academy Brian Berry Prize. And his paper is Responding to Riots, a Grounded Normativity Analysis of Recent UK Riot Discourse. Ying Chang uh, just defended her political theory uh, doctorate at Princeton University. So she is a uh, professor now, uh, a, a doctorate, and she works on uh, post-colonial global justice and post-colonial theory. And Ying won the prize uh, postdoctoral research fellowship at Newfield College and uh, at, at Oxford University. In 2023, she'll be joining the Department of Political Science at uh, UCLA University College London. And the title of her uh, paper, uh, her presentation is Prefiguring Democracy in Democratic Resistance. And Avia Pasternak is an associate professor in political theory at the Department of Political Science at UCL, University College London. And her book, Responsible Citizens, Irresponsible States with OUP, uh, has just been published at OUP. And she also works on the ethics of violent protest in democratic states. And the title of her presentation is The Necessity of Violent Protests. So I turn it over to them and I'll be moderating the Q&A sessions when we get there. Thanks. Okay. Everyone can see this, the slides? Yeah? Okay, good. Okay, so um, this, is, this paper kind of grows out of a, a British Academy fellowship that I'm working on, uh, it's admittedly quite empirical for a philosophy conference, but, but basically the impetus for it is the more I dig into riots and the rioting literature, the less I know what a riot is. So if there's kind of a tie into the question of ontology, I'm still kind of grappling with what is a riot and I'll kind of explain why in a second and then why my research has taken a, an empirical turn. So, um, there's been a fair bit of kind of recent political philosophy I'm writing myself, Avia's work and kind of several other leading scholars. And, and most of this work, including my own, situates itself in political philosophy uh, in respect to the kind of civil versus uncivil disobedience distinction. And this really, this kind of framing in political philosophy at least kind of grows out of Rawls's take, I'd say, uh, in the 19, 1970s, it's kind of quite influential. And kind of the, for lack of a better term, I'll just call it first generation takes on civil disobedience, like Rawls up until say about maybe five, 10 years ago, essentially saw rioting as unacceptable or unjustifiable because uncivil and because they're, because riots are essentially violent, right? So that's the, the kind of linking of that logic. So the central issue in this debate, especially kind of the turn towards the ethics of rioting or, or uh, kind of justified protest, has been what, if anything, might justify the violence of a protest, right? And so there's been kind of drawing on just war theory, drawing on kind of other traditions of resistance to kind of think through what might possibly justify, um, justify kind of the violence that we associate with riots. Um, so I'm, I'm increasingly kind of finding this view problematic. And this is kind of a view that I also, my, my own work kind of initially advanced. Um, and part of it is that this is really the state's view of a protest. And so I'm kind of attacking this from two directions. One is increasingly historical. The more I've kind of looked into the history of rioting and protest and I'm kind of focusing on the UK because that's where I'm based at the moment. Um, it's, it's quite obvious that riot law itself was developed in the UK over a period of 400 years largely as a way for the state to crack down on dissent. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. 
But when we look at kind of rioting from below, so from the view of the protesters, they either A, don't see it as a riot, or they at least don't see it as illegitimate, the action. They've actually, there's a kind of a long history and people like um, George Roudet and E.P. Thompson, like there's a lot, a lot of kind of social history that's looked at this as seeing that rioting for a long period of time, uh, in England at least, was seen as um, restoring the moral order. That actually was kind of quite, the uh, E.P. Thompson kind of put it as like, restoring customary law that that peasants and kind of the the, the lower orders as with kind of the pre-industrial revolution term would often recourse to riots or protest as a way of challenging what they saw as breaches of the common law or customary law by elites so rioting was often equated with kind of price gouging with respect to food or protesting acts of enclosure against areas that have been held in common often by kind of wealthy elites so it was very much a way of kind of protecting um, the subsistence of the lower orders and the, and the kind of peasant class, if you will. Okay, much of the rioting literature, however, treats legitimate rioting as an exception because riots are generally seen as taboo. And so part of this has been a shift in kind of how the culture understands rioting, I'd say over the, and kind of really up until the 1960s, there may have been more acceptance of that. And again, kind of the primary thing, this is actually in a lot of ways kind of an auto critique here, that myself and kind of my just rioting theory article kind of is very careful for, for obvious reasons to kind of stake out that some riots and obviously the paradigmatic example here would be the Black Lives Matter riots might be justified under limited conditions, but most riots are not. Um, but the more I look into this, actually, I think that the earlier framing may have more basis in the sense that most participants in what we consider riots actually see themselves as simply Kind of engaging in protests. And so there's a couple of reasons for this. So the first one is really a key feature of the common law around riots. So this is the common law tradition. So this is both how riots are treated in the UK, but also Canada and the US too, and any other country that has a common law tradition. So rioting as kind of a common law offense can be traced back to the Middle Ages, but it's kind of developed in a very interesting way over time, right? And so there's a, a very unique theory, a, a kind of feature about riot law, right? So riot law can, in kind of contemporary legal orders is usually treated under public assembly law. And one of the key features of this is the, the kind of sole authority and discretionary power with respect to making something a riot is the commanding officer on the site of a public gathering, usually a protest. And so this actually gives the commanding officer a, a lot of discretionary judgment. They, they obviously have to work within the guidelines of the, the local police order, but essentially that officer determines at what point the protest has become violent enough to declare a riot. And the key kind of criteria under common law, something called the ter terrorism in populi, which is basically the public, not an individual, but the public is kind of an abstract concept, has to be terrified by the actions of the crowd. And part of the reason for this, and this goes back to the 1700s, declaring a riot effectively indemnifies the police against being charged for harming protesters. And so once the riot act is read, the police can do essentially whatever they want. We kind of saw a lot of this last summer in the George Floyd protests where the police actually were quite indemnified right up until killing protesters actually indemnified once a riot's been declared. And it also has the other peculiar feature of making anyone present at the scene of something that's been declared a riot guilty by their mere presence. So your crime is actually just happening to be in a crowd once a riot's been declared, you can actually then be charged with riot if you don't listen to the dispersal order. Um, and so one of the effects of this is that there's frequent cases of kind of what's called overcharging of protesters where police will quite deliberately kind of overcharge knowing full well that the charges won't hand up in court as a way of dispersing a public protest and also the use of public assembly law to delegitimize or block protests. And the UK has kind of got a lot of interesting regulations there where the Home Secretary can kind of preemptively ban, ban a protest too. Okay, so part of this kind of just grows out historically. So there's, there's essentially four major shifts in riot law in England. The first one, which is where the Riot Act comes from 1714, right? This is where the, where the expression reading the Riot Act comes from. The, the bill actually is, the, that's the moment where the, the mechanism of the kind of commanding officer at this point in time as a magistrate could declare a riot. They actually had to read out the dispersal order that was enacted in the act. And so that's where the, the expression reading the riot act comes from. But the crucial feature here is that 
major changes in riot law in England, and actually there's a little bit of this evidence of this in the US as well, essentially is not responding to issues of public disorder in the sense of kind of random people rioting. In every single instance, you could clearly see it as an instance of the state tightening protest law as a way to clamp down on some kind of insurgent protest movement. So this, the riot acts actually triggered by what was called the Jacobite uprising and other kind of nascent movements who are protesting the ascension to the English throne of the, ha the House of Hanover in 1714, in 1714, 1715. The second kind of major change is a shift in kind of judicial interpretations of the riot act. And this is where the doctrine of unlawful assembly is introduced that basically it, it grows out of a kind of very famous moment in English history called the Peterloo Massacre, which was essentially there was a large mass gathering in St. Peter's Field in Manchester in the early 19th century where the participants were demanding the expansion of the franchise and um, the, local, the local militia dispersed, dispersed the protest and killed, um, killed about uh, in, somewhere in the teens, I think 14 or 15 protesters. And it was kind of an outrage at the time, but what's interesting is the courts responded by saying the protesters were guilty of this thing called unlawful assembly. And what was bad about a riot wasn't the violence, but actually was the size of the crowd. The argument is the crowd was so big, so it was in the tens of thousands, that it scared the, the local residents. And that was why the police were then, the militia was justified in using violence to disperse the, the order. And so it had this peculiar effect in the 19th century of the larger the protest was, the more likely it was to be declared a riot. Then in 1986, this is kind of where the, the modern kind of public order act is introduced. And again, here it's a response by the Thatcher government to kind of anti, to first of all, inner city rioting, which was responding to kind of police brutality in the 1980s. And then the minor strike in 1986, which also had kind of a few kind of major instances of, of scuffles or kind of actual full on brawls between the police and the miners. So very much here, this is the moment actually where the violence provision gets brought into the British common law. And then now in the UK, there's something called the police crime and sentencing bill which is kind of increasingly um, restricting the right to protest as well. And this is a response to Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter protests and other kind of recent protests. So the thing to note here is that riot law actually emerges not in response to what we would think of kind of as like um, dangerous or non-legitimate rioting, but in every single case that emerges in response to kind of a mass social movement and the protest tactics that are being used by that movement. And then the state essentially reads in the actions of the protesters, whatever tactics they're engaged in, as being kind of dangerous and hence riotous. Okay, so this is then kind of prompting a few key questions in my research and kind of a little bit of a shift here. So the first one's how does the constitution of political of pr protest by authorities as riots? Because really what's going on here is the authority, the state essentially has the, the power to declare something either a legitimate protest or a riot through public order law then shape the public's perception of the underlying grievance of the protest. And then how does the protesters resist the condemnation of their action by public authority? And so what, what I'm drawing on here methodologically is a recent shift that grows out of the, the kind of scholarship of, of kind of political philosophers such as James Tully, Glenn Coulthard and, and Audra Simpson and Brooke Ackerley who have all kind of advanced something they're calling grounded normativity. So what, what they mean by this at its core is that, that, that really political philosophers should turn to empirical analysis of problems to develop engaged normative accounts of justice. And I think the Ackerley article that came out in, in CRISP earlier this year might be the best kind of spelling out of the core tenets of it. So part of, part of the reason to turn to kind of the empirical is it can, we can kind of expand the comprehensiveness of the input in terms of we understand what the phenomenon is. We're increasingly attentive to the systemic, systematic exclusions of a range of different voices. Crucially for my work here is the idea of recursivity, right? That by kind of looking at the, we begin with kind of our philosophical assumptions, but by looking at kind of how things play out in practice, perhaps we can kind of revise our, our theories over time. And then also, I think most importantly, from an ethical standpoint, the accountability to those effective, affected by the normative claim. So my project here actually has kind of three key empirical components. And so I'm just gonna kind of lay out, first one's kind of completed, the second one's in process, the third one actually is the recursive part, which will grow out of this and I'll explain at the very end. So, um, 
part one is basically an overview of the last 25 years of riots in the UK. And so I've managed the, the fellowship to hire a research assistant who's quite skilled at things like um, GIS. So it's just kind of useful because I'm not skilled at all at that anymore. And so what we've done is we sat down and we essentially identified every ride in the UK over the last 25 years. We pulled this from basically a few sources. So media sources kind of tracking the major documents of riot outbreaks in the UK. And then we've cross-checked that with um, the national the, the comparative national time series analysis data set, which my comparative political science friends kind of use quite a lot in their research for, for kind of looking at, at uh, political trends in countries over time. And one of the things it tracks is rioting. And so there's a couple of things that just kind of immediately jump out at this. The first thing is that rioting is actually down and down quite significantly over the last 50 years. And this comes out of the kind of the cross national time series analysis. So although there's, I guess I'd say at the moment, a moral panic around rioting, uh, both in the US and in the UK, because there's been this introduction of a lot of laws in the last year and a half uh, to kind of expand what counts as a riot under both US and UK law. Um, rioting itself as a, as a form of protest is actually significantly down. Um, looking at some of the historical sources like George Goudet in a, in a um, in a 50-year uh, period, and identifies 235 different food riots in England in the, 19, in the 1700s, and we were only able to identify 62 riots in the last 25 years in the UK. So it's actually a significant drop by more than 50%. And there's an article by Murphy uh, in Foreign Policy who, uh, from a few years ago, who's looking at the trends globally, but essentially was saying that even though there was a spike post-2011 of um, global rioting, after that, there was actually a significant drop off and there, and there was not much before going back to the 1960s, so the, the last major spike. Um, the other thing we've kind of dug up is that what are the, what are the kinds of riots? So I'll kind of have a few kind of empirical slides in a moment, but um, the largest cause of riot in the UK is Northern Ireland. So that's kind of an ongoing sectarian conflict. So, but that's actually the largest kind of subset of rioting. The other thing is that the other major causes are response to the police brutality. So the, the largest kind of spike is in 2011, which is a response to the murder of uh, a black man by the, the London police, uh, the London Metropolitan Police named Mark Duggan. That's kind of sparked off a wave of rioting first in Tottenham and then across the UK. Um, the, the other major ones kind of political riots which are mostly anti-capitalist protests. So the two biggest spikes here were in response to the G20 and also kind of in response to the, the cuts that were introduced by the coalition government back in early 2010. Uh, then there's inter-ethnic violence. And so the kind of paradigmatic example in England uh, was there was riots that broke out in the in Midlands town called Oldham in 2001, which was between the Asian community and the white community involves kind of actions by the British Nationalist Party and some white nationalist groups. And then the other major cause is sporting events, which um, actually is mostly football. And though, although in the literature, sporting events are kind of seen off as, um, um, as kind of apolitical riots, both Millwall FC and the English national team, a lot of the action actually appears to be again tied into to white nationalist groups or British national party groups for, for kind of complicated reasons. So if you kind of look at the chart here, um, there's a couple of things that kind of jump out. So, some that might not be perhaps all that interesting to general people, but one thing that jumped out to me is because I've been doing a lot of historical work is there's no more food rioting. And in, at least in England, at least, there hasn't been a prison riot in the last 25 years that we could identify. And actually, historically, those are kind of major causes of riots, just kind of economic deprivation. So actually, most of our contemporary riots are in some way, shape, or form, I would say, political. Uh, the other thing to look at here is that um, again, the, the incidence of riots over time is kind of comparatively low. It's basically one or two riots a year, apart from a spike in 2011, which is tied to the Tottenham riots. But that's actually, if you look at the global data, that's actually also the last major year prior to 2020, where there was a significant global spike in riots. And that's, I think, I, think you could prob I, I would say that even though we can kind of know what in both cases, police brutality is the direct cause of those riots, the other interesting thing is those are both kind of periods of kind of economic downturn. So 2011 was kind of all the Arab Spring and the the kind of the um, 
the protests there were kind of very much tied into, you could kind of make a case there was a response to the 2008 financial crisis. And all, obviously all of the, the 2020 protests in the US were clearly triggered by the murder of George Floyd. I think there's kind of pretty, you know, I think there'd be, don't have the evidence for it, but I'd say there'd probably be a pretty good political science case to look at whether or not the pandemic also triggered other riots in other places too. This is just kind of for the long durée, you can kind of see that over time there's a few spikes. The last time's 1919, which was A, a pandemic year, but also the end of World War II. And then 1980, when the Thatcher government came into power. And then again, this kind of spike in 2011. But the rest of the time, there's actually not that many riots per year. Okay, so what is this, why does this matter? I think, first of all, the no food riots, prison riots, or urban, and urban riots being kind of very slight is significant because these are the kinds of riots that are caused by social deprivation and often in the, the literature are seen as um, kind of apolitical riots. But currently most riots in England, at least or in the UK at least, have a political cause. So they're triggered by a long-standing grievance. So whether it's Northern Ireland, police violence, interracial tensions, or British nationalism, um, most riots are kind of clearly instances of political protest that have either been declared by the police unlawful order or have kind of broken out into violence. Um, okay, so the second part here is uh, now looking at kind of how do governments and then people respond to it. So essentially what I've done is after taking this kind of large snapshot, I'm zeroing in on th basically three major sets of riots. So the Oldham riots, which, uh, which were, were these kind of inter-ethnic clashes between Asian and white communities in Oldham, but also across the British Midlands in early 2001. And here the government responded with a, a very strong, strong focus on multiculturalism integration. There's kind of numerous reports about this, direct investment in the community, and a lot of push for kind of things like local youth sports groups that tried to get the white and Asian community integrate, an emphasis on kind of, um, the kind of pushing students away from religious schools towards kind of public educate, uh, kind of uh, state state sponsored education, whereby you'd have kind of greater integration that way. So the focus there was really on integration. The London G20 protests were very much a case of like the, the protesters clashing with the police. And the response here was focused on police tactics, but not the underlying grievance of the protesters, which is anti-capitalism. Right, so that, that's basically, there's no response anywhere from the government to, to kind of any questions about the G20 or climate change issues. It's entirely about the fact that the police start using uh, tactics like kettling and one of the protesters was killed as a result of police action. And so there was kind of a promise to look at the different ways the police, um, police protest, if you will. And the 2011 uh, response is actually quite negative to the riot. So it's very much kind of a way I think was what I would assume would be the classic response. It focuses half the response from the government focuses on the criminality of the rioters and talks about how tough they've been, points, points out kind of how the sentences are significantly longer. Then as a section on adjusting social uh, deprivation, but then there's no action taken to the primary grievance of the riot, which is the murder of Mark Duggan, which is in many ways kind of triggered in a similar way to the George Floyd protest. It was basically a brief paragraph at the end of this 60 page report saying, oh, we'll talk to the police about kind of stop and frisk tactics. Um, okay. So, let's go over here. So in a certain sense, this I think complicates my work and perhaps other riot work. Right. So there, one of the debates in the riot literature is between the riots works crowd and the riots are, are futile. So kind of futile. So the, the you know, Gio Chicariello Mayher's work, he's kind of argued for a long time, for about a decade, that rioting works. So he's kind of making a pragmatic ar argument that rioting tactics actually get results when normal nonviolent protest tactics don't. That's actually quite a contentious claim because you can look at other um, kind of empirical social scientists who look at uh, the effects of nonviolent versus violent protests and actually argue that riots don't work and nonviolent protests do. But there's also kind of going back in the literature, people like Michael Walser and Hannah Arendt, one of their critiques of rioting back in the 1970s, kind of in response to the events of the 60s, was that riots are actually futile and don't change things, right? So they'd argue that the grievances are just ignored. Um, in some sense, the grievances are ignored, but it looks like the government tends to respond by investing in the root causes. Or I think the other thing that's noticeable is basically how the media and the public seem to be a mediating factor here, right? So it addresses the bad media problems, right? So basically if the media gets upset about something, so it looks to me like the G20 protest at least, 
there was a media outrage about how the police roughed up a bunch of you know youths basically youth young, young protesters often who are kind of middle class and so this this generated bad media and then there was a need for the government to kind of respond to that claim but in the case of the Tottenham riots the government decla declares the riot condemns the rioters and doesn't really do much apart from talking about how much they're going to address kind of root causes around schooling or stuff. The, the activist responses also tend to condemn the rioters, but they also warn of a repeat if the root causes is, is not addressed. And actually David Lem, who's the MP for Tottenham, it's kind of been ongoing for a decade now, kind of hammering that, that kind of angle. It's obviously kind of politically motivated, but it's worth noting that even there, it's not a justification of the riots or the rioting, but he's pushing harder for kind of police reform as a response to this. Okay, so the third part's kind of ongoing. So what I'm going to do, and this is the kind of the recursive part of grabbing normativity, is then present my discussion and paper to um, politicians and to kind of three key groups. And we're gonna break them into separate groups. And it's gonna be kind of Chatham House rules, but what I'm essentially doing is knowing full well they're going to rubbish what I have to say, say I'm just a useless academic and they know how things work in the real world. And that's actually what I want because I want to kind of use that to, to see what I'm missing again. So we'll have three different stakeholder meetings in the autumn. The first is with politicians and government officials. The second is going to be with police and lawyers. We're going to talk about how kind of how, how protests are policed and how riots are handled from the police. And then the third will be from activist groups and NGO groups, groups, you know, I won't name them here, but kind of groups that are involved in active protests that may or may not be declared riots and kind of see how they, they understand what they're doing and how they understand riot law and public order law being assembled with them. So I think this, the, the point of all this really is, as I said, um, to think a little bit more in a bit more nuanced, and kind of including myself here, about how we how we as political philosophers understand riots, right? So we tend to treat legitimate riots as the exception, but I think one of the things that's popping up in this research is that most riots are simply protests that for various reasons, the state or police officers have declared as unlawful. Now that could be because of the tactics of the protesters, but the whole point here is that they, they and so it doesn't necessarily mean that then all riots are justified, obviously, but most riots kind of express an underlying grievance. And if you look in a lot of the rioting literature, there's, there's a common kind of rhetorical move where well, we're not talking about all riots, but um, actually, I think in most cases we are. The, the paradigmatic example actually is a grievance riot as opposed to being an exception. So, and in all these cases, I'd say that the reasons for rioting, if they're not justifiable or at least understandable in some sense. Like some of them, I don't want to say that all riots are, are you know, justified or even um, reasonable because some, some of this stuff is kind of interracial conflict where you have the groups like the British National Party or other white nationalists using rioting as a tactic to essentially it's a program, right? Whether the plans to kind of use violence to, to attack other people. Second thing to note is that riot law developed as a means to police protest, right? So the point here is that we should start to see protest and rioting as kind of part of a continuum. As a, and so perhaps this kind of blurs the civil, uncivil disobedience kind of line a bit further. And so the other thing it raises, I think, from a, from a kind of policing perspective is it's raised a lot of questions about freedom of assembly being threatened through riot law. And I think especially both in the US and the UK, the recent turn to adding new things like in the US blocking the highway or essentially a lot of states kind of through an initiative backed by ALEC over the last year have kind of brought in um, expansions to state riot law that have essentially looked at the tactics used by Black Lives Matter protesters or pipeline protesters and essentially added those as possible things that would justify declaring a uh, protest unlawful and then punishing the protesters. And then the third thing here I think is the effectiveness of riots addressing grievances is limited. And so I think here what's needed is actually not not what I think is kind of a, a not particularly productive binary right now in the scholarship where riots are either useful or futile, but really we need to kind of think a little bit more about the effectiveness of riots addressing, addressing grievances. Like it's not super effective, but it does have some impact. So it does seem that governments actually tend to crack down quite harshly on rioters, but they often respond by addressing what I call high profile problems or kind of throwing a lot of money at the problem and kind of doing a root cause thing. 
And so I suspect that public opinion and media treatment of the riots might be a mediating factor here, but um, I still need to do a bit more thinking about that. So I'll stop there. Thank you okay. very much. Okay, great. So who's next? We're already a little behind. Uh, great, yeah, Ying. Next. Go ahead. Um, thank you so much, Jonathan. That was super interesting. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this symposium. Um, I thought I'd take this chance uh, to present some preliminary ideas about a project on democratic resistance that I've been thinking about um, after finishing my uh, doctoral project recently. So the project is in very early stages. I'd appreciate any feedback, suggestions. Um, I'm interested in the topic of undemocratic means for democratic ends in protest and resistance more broadly. So in particular, I'm thinking about campaigns of protest and resistance that aim to topple or reform an undemocratic regime and replace it with a broadly democratic one. These campaigns can take the form of anything from civil disobedience to riots to revolution. I'll, I'll just call this category of protest democratic resistance. Democratic resistance aims to set up a democratic and egalitarian society in which ordinary citizens are empowered and disposed to participate in co-ruling. But the process of resistance also often calls for practices that seem antithetical to the democratic values um, that underline uh, the, the aim of the protests or, or resistance and would seem to undermine the kinds of norms and dispositions that are needed to sustain democratic equality in the long run. So think of anti-colonial revolutions as an example. Many anti-colonial revolutions were also democratic revolutions, but their resistance against colonial regimes employed practices such as hierarchical and unaccountable leadership, undemocratic decision-making, use of manipulation, propaganda, coercion, and so on. And so it seems that there's a tension between the means and the ends, one that might contribute to shaping to an extent the outcome of democratic resistance. For example, many anti-colonial revolutions ended in authoritarianism and some anti-colonial thinkers, despite their ideals, such as Kwame Nkrumah or Mao Zedong became dictators with personality cults. So of course, many factors contribute to the rise of authoritarian regimes. But there's also generally thought to be a connection between means of protest and long-term political outcomes. So for example, there's empirical literature um, that Jonathan also mentioned that attests to the long-term effects of violent versus nonviolent forms of disobedience on democratic stability. So if there's generally a plausible connection between means and ends in protests, the question I'm interested in is whether participants have a duty to democratize the very process of resistance. In other words, to prefigure to the extent that's reasonably possible, and I'll talk about this in a moment, the norms and practices associated with relating to one another as democratic equals. And I'll call this duty um, the, a duty to prefigure democratic equality. So I use the term democratic equality in a broad sense. Um, it encompasses not only the decision-making procedures that give individuals an equal share of influence, but also a set of norms, practices, and dispositions that promote and makes valuable this kind of decision-making. So some such norms and practices that democratic theorists commonly think are important include practices of open and inclusive deliberation, free exchange of information, norms of mutual respect, habits of political vigilance, dispositions of solidarity, and so on. And underlying these norms and practices is an ideal of democratic equality in which persons treat one another with mutual respect and take each other as entitled to participation in collective self-determination. To prefigure democratic equality in the process of resistance then means to structure and conduct campaigns of protest in such a way that embodies the kind of social and political relations that protesters and resistance fighters are hoping to attain in the future. This might mean, for example, engaging in practices such as decentralized decision-making, deliberative democracy, refraining from manipulative propaganda, and emphasis on empowering disadvantaged agents such as women and minorities in political participation and so on. Now, a strong version of this duty 
would require agents to structure their campaigns of resistance along democratic principles, even if this foreseeably results in significant harm to their basic interests. This version of the duty is self-defeating. If dissidents organizing under surveillance regimes, for example, have to engage in open deliberation with one another, their political resistance would just very likely fail and result in dire consequences for the participants. A weak version of this duty, on the other hand, would require that agents prefigure democratic equality only when all else is equal. That is, if it would be just as easy to opt for more democratic ways of conducting political resistance, then participants should do so. But for reasons I'll discuss shortly, I think this is too weak. Finally, the moderate version, which is what I'm interested in, asks agents to bear a non-trivial, but also not self-defeating degree of risk. And that is, if opting for democratic practices would heighten the level of risk to participants, but not to the point of near certainty of harm, participants should conduct the resistance in a way that promotes and conforms to democratic norms. So in the following, I'll focus on exploring whether this moderate version of the duty can be justified. Now, the question of prefiguring democratic equality in protest and resistance is different from two related debates. First, there's interesting debate on whether protests undermine democracy by subverting democratically sanctioned policies and laws. But the focus here is on protests that attempt to establish a democratic society in the first place. And so since existing policies and laws were not passed by a democratic system, the concern of undermining democratic legitimacy is not as pressing. But the question remains of whether participants should uphold and promote democratic norms in conducting their resistance. The question is also distinct from the debate over the question of nonviolence in protests, which has received a surge of interest um, in contemporary political theory. So there are some parallels between the, the, the two questions. For example, um, Karuna Mantena has argued that Gandhi and King's view of nonviolence as disciplined action is based on the perceived connection between the dispositions and affect that's fostered in political action and the ends that can be achieved. In particular, Gandhi and King were concerned that violence and coercion breeds resentment and egoism, which would undermine the goal of establishing a just and stable society. So similarly, one might think that democratic practices within campaigns of resistance can foster the kinds of habits and dispositions needed to relate to others as democratic equals. But the question of prefiguring democratic equality can arise even if one rejects uh, nonviolence or civility and disobedience. So Candace Delmas, for example, rejects the idea that protesters should prefigure the change that they want to see. She argues that even if protesters are hoping to achieve a just and stable society in the long run, uncivil disobedience is sometimes necessary and incivility such as acts of violence against oppressors can promote the self-respect of the oppressed and help them reclaim political agency as apart from considerations of effectiveness. But one can agree that violence is permissible in the circumstances that Dalmas delineates but still ask whether particip participants should engage in democratic practices with one another. At least in principle, violent resistance is not mutually exclusive from democratic forms of leadership, decision-making and deliberation. Although of course, in practice, it may be very difficult to sustain democratic practices if it's true that violent resistance tends to escalate and spiral out of control. But consider the Zapatistas, for example. They are armed and they have engaged in military offensives, but internally they're organized in accordance with principles of radical democracy and empowerment of the people. So decisions are generally made, for example, in people's assemblies after deliberation, and women are, are um, intentionally um, empowered. So the point is that violent resistance and democratic practice aren't necessarily exclusive, and the latter raises distinctive questions of its own. So I'll now turn to explore whether there might be um, such a duty to prefigure democratic equality. And I'll tentatively argue that there is. I wanna reject one approach first. We might think that protesters and resistance fighters are morally hypocritical if they themselves can't live by the principles they claim to be fighting for. If they're to criticize and protest against the status quo in disruptive ways, the argument goes, they should at least hold themselves accountable to the ideals that motivate them. Now there's perhaps some truth to the claim, but following Delmas, I'm skeptical that we should place much weight on this. Moral hypocrisy is undoubtedly a vice, 
but the importance of resisting oppression would seem to outweigh the wrongness of the vice. The more egregious the injustice that's faced by protesters, the less it seems to me that we should worry about hypocrisy. If putting a stop to the injustice requires means that differ drastically from the just ends that they hope to attain. In fact, as um, Fanon suggests in his analysis of the colonial situation in the wretched of the earth, one of the greatest injustices of systemic oppression is to make it nearly impossible for people to be good. Requiring them to do so places an unreasonable burden um, on the oppressed. So then why might there be a duty to prefigure democratic equality in protest? The first argument turns on the idea of reasonable prospects for success. So theorists such as Avia Pasternak has argued that one condition for violent disobedience like riots to be permissible is when there's reasonable chance that disobedience can successfully ignite political change or at least bring about some important benefits. Now, insofar as a particular campaign of democratic resistance employs violence, then the same condition would also apply. If engaging in democratic practices heightens the chance of the campaign success in attaining the goal of establishing a democratic society, then there might be a close connection, uh, sorry, then there might be a duty, it would seem that there's a duty for participants to do so. And there are at least two reasons to think that there might be a close connection between the two. The first reason to think th uh, this is that democratic citizenship requires cultivation. Learning to relate to others as democratic equals is no easy task, and especially for individuals living in deeply unjust cir circumstances. And here again, Fanon is helpful. Fanon analyzes the psychology of the oppressed and points out that oppression cultivates habits that are antithetical to democratic citizenship, such as passivity, resignation, self-interestedness, and distrust. He argues that unless the national liberation struggle helps individuals cultivate new habits of vigilance, self-confidence, solidarity, then post-colonial independence would just be a sham because indigenous elites take, would take over from colonialists and continue to roll over, rule over a habitually disempowered people. Conducting resistance in ways that promote democratic norms then can have important educative effects that strengthen the uh, prospects of um, establishing a democratic society in the long run. Now, second, a campaign of resistance that's broadly organized along democratic principles can communicate to others, especially outsiders, that protesters can be trusted with acting in the common good. It's a form of public assurance that protesters are not only fighting to advantage themselves, thereby it increases the likelihood that undecided others will join the campaign. And in so far as this increases mobilization, it also contributes to greater prospect of success. So the second argument for our duty to prefigure democratic equality um, has less to do with the means end relationship, um, sorry, the sort of effectiveness of, um, uh, of certain practices, but instead starts from the idea that resistance is a collective endeavor that relies on others' willingness to bear a significant degree of risk and foreseeable harm. So in other words, resistance requires sacrifice. I want to suggest that when individuals enlist each other's wills in such a way, there's a duty to answer to one another. In campaigns of resistance, unilateral actions have collective consequences that can quickly result in severe harms to basic interests, such as injury, death, loss of freedom. So if some protesters decide to escalate and use violence, for example, this often invites indiscriminate violence from the state to crack down on, this, on the dissidents. But these protesters also rely and depend on others in the movement to protect and shelter them, to respond in solidarity when crackdowns happen. And so it would seem that they have an especially strong responsibility to justify their actions to one another and to subject decisions to collective determination, even if it means taking on an additional risk or cost. Not doing so would seem to amount to a failure to respect others as equals in arms, so to speak. Now, this preliminary consideration suggests that even in contexts of undemocratic societies and circumstances where violence is morally permissible, individuals engaged in political resistance may still have duties to constrain their political action by democratic norms. Of course, there's much more to be said, but in the remaining time, I want to consider some questions that such a duty opens up. Now, if there's a duty to prefigure democratic equality and resistance, what does this mean in political practice? 
what ways of structuring and conducting political resistance might better foster the kinds of habits and dispositions needed to sustain the long-term goal of relating to others as equals. There are many aspects of political resistance that such a duty will bear on and each deserve further investigation. For example, activists often engage in political education that is collective learning that's oriented towards deepening participants' understanding of the oppression that they face and the proposed solutions that they're fighting for. The Black Panthers, for example, famously integrated lessons in Marxism and white supremacy with their breakfast program. In the early days of the Chinese Communist Party, Mao Zedong led teach-ins in rural China to train peasant activists. Now, if, if participants in the resistance movement should promote democratic norms and practices and prefigure what it means to treat others as equals, the concern here is how might political education not become political propaganda, such as participants are empowered instead of manipulated by those in the leadership. Another aspect of resistance is secrecy and deception. Often resistance movements need to make use of underground networks in which participants aren't aware of who is issuing orders or they lack access to important information that others have. So these strategies are important for protecting participants, but cultures of secrecy and deception lend themselves to habits of distrust and lack of accountability. They're antithetical to the kind of culture of transparency that are needed to sustain a healthy democracy. Moreover, if participants have claims to be treated as equals, if even in the process of fighting together, what does this demand in terms of covert organizing? A third aspect is leadership and relatedly decision-making. Um, obviously elections and voting are not always possible and almost never possible in more extreme forms of democratic resistance, such as revolutions. A moral requirement to do so would seem excessively demanding. Absent electoral authorization, then how might democratic leadership be possible? What might accountability look like? One alternative draws from Fanon's account of dialogic leadership, in which leaders and participants learn from each other and guide each other in turn. Fanon observed that those from social positions of privilege tend to become de facto leaders in the anti-colonial revolutions. So for example, the colon what he calls the colonized intellectuals who are trained in the metropoles often come back and become the leaders of anti-colonial resistance. So there's a danger um, that preoccupy Fanon that they remain alienated from the needs and views of the people even as they claim to represent them. An essential part of revolutionary leadership for Fanon is for leaders to live amongst the most disadvantaged and marginalized groups and practice a kind of epistemic and political humility in learning from their culture and their worldviews. Now, on the other hand, the rise of leaderless protests in recent years seems to offer a more democratic alternative than movements that follow a more top-down structure, such as the more traditional anti-colonial revolutions. So to use an example that I'm familiar with, the Hong Kong protests of 2019 was seen as an innovative mode of protest in which participants deliberately eschewed the endorsement or establishment of any kind of leadership. And instead they mobilized and even made strategic decisions via online discussion and voting. Now, if there's a duty to prefigure democratic equality, should resistance movements endorse leaderless modes of organizing wherever possible? Tentatively, I'm inclined to think the contrary. Although leaderless movements don't have traditional um, forms of hierarchical authority, they're far from democratic as individual participants or small groups within the movement can unilaterally decide to act in such a way that changes the course of the movement, as we saw in the escalatory violence in the Hong Kong protests. Such movements also end up privileging the voices of those who are already advantaged in, exist in various ways, such as those who already have um, public um, credit or you know, who are taken seriously for various reasons, or who have channels of informal influence and so on. So in the Hong Kong case, those who had access to online forums were primarily the ones who were driving the movement. Instead then, if there's a duty for protesters to prefigure what it means to relate to others as equals, then participants in spontaneous acts of resistance like riots should organize um, and should get organized as a first step in acting on such a duty. So there's no doubt much more to be said about any of the points and questions I've raised. And I'll end here by reiterating that these are some very tentative ideas um, and I'm very much looking forward to feedback and suggestions. Thank you. Okay, great.
Thanks for this. And uh, last but not least is Avia. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much. And I'm already seeing very interested connection between all the papers. So, so that's, that's nice. I mean, that was the intention, but that's really nice. Okay, so what I'm going to present to you is um, part of as a chapter that is part of the book I'm, I'm now working on, on the moral justification of violent protests uh, in democratic states. And I cover in the book uh, a large variety of protests, from protests against uh, police violence, like the one um, that Jonathan was mentioning in his talks, to protests against socioeconomic injustice, like the uh, UK uh, 2011 at London riots, uh, protests against environmental justices, and protests in prisons and in detention centers. And I think in line with what Jonathan has already said, what all of these protests share in common is that their, the agency resorts to violence, um, mostly violence against property, although not only on behalf of some viable uh, political goals. Now, the goal of the book is to assess whether uh, such violence can be justified and what, and if, if so, what and what levels of violence protesters may be justified in inflicting on the body and property of citizens and state officers. And to do that, I use uh, the framework of defensive harm, um, which um, again, I, I think is, is, is the appropriate one. So I think that uh, I argue that violent protests are a form of self-defense against state attack on the rights of oppressed minorities. And what follows from that is I suggest that we need to use the tests that we commonly use to justify defense and harm in order to evaluate these properties, these protests. So I'm talking about necessity, effectiveness, and proportionality. Okay, so in the other chapters, I talk about the question of proportionality and effectiveness. The chapters I want to present to you today focuses on the necessity test. Um, so for reasons of simplicity, I'm going to assume uh, that the effectiveness and proportionality tests have been met and we, or can be met and we are focusing just on necessity. Okay, obviously that needs to be shown, but I cannot do everything in, in one presentation. So I'm just talking about necessity. Now, necessity, of course, is a very much discussed uh, condition in the literature and ethics of self-defense. And again, in the paper, I go into the various definitions, but just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to um, use a fairly, I think, familiar dis distinction that largely follows uh, Cesc Lazar's work. And that tells us that um, what necessity requires is that um, when deploying defensive harm, the defender should risk imposing uh, the least morally weighted harm of all the alternatives that are open, okay? And we are using here an evidence-based standard on my part, okay? Now, the chapter is quite long. It advances several claims, and I decided to focus on the last part of the paper, which relates to the issue of collective action uh, for two reasons. One, because this is the, the, the bit where it's um, the newest ideas for me and the ones that I'm least sure of, so I would love to have some feedback, and also because I think it, it fits most nicely with the kind of the general um, theme of the conference. So before I dive into the argument, I just want to tell you kind of very broad brushstrokes what happens before so you, you understand where, where, where we're entering into. Okay, so in the first part of the chapter, I respond to the familiar objection that the resort to uncivil and violent protest cannot meet a necessity test in democratic states and also perhaps in some non-democratic states because citizens have uh, non-violent alternatives for political action. So I argue in response to that objection that in cases of serious structural injustices, it can actually be the case that oppressed minorities' access to traditional nonviolent forms of political participation are actually limited, or that these forms of participation are ineffective. And I also suggest, and this is um, drawing on Saba's work, I also suggest that we can view um, the communication of anger and defiance as important political goals, and it can be the case that these goals cannot communicate it through entirely nonviolent uh, measures. And the second part of the paper I kind of move on to discuss um, what, uh, what this tells us for specific types of violence that oppressed protesters may deploy. Um, because as we know, they can deploy different types. Um, so harm to persons, harm to property, harm to police officers, harm to uh, uh, cit fellow citizens, private individuals. And by and large, I suggest that damage to public property uh, will generally inflict the least morally weighted harm and is therefore what the necessity test would recommend. I also suggest that protesters may target the property of some private agents who are themselves uh, inexcusably complicit in this injustice against, with, against which the protest rise. 
And I suggest that the necessity condition does not rule out inflicting bodily harm on police officers, um, but that they should uh, aim to limit the harm they cause to police officers and especially to police officers without bodily protection. Okay, this is a very brief summary and I'm sure there are lots of questions, but I did want to zoom on on what happened in section three, um, um, where I talked to one specific challenge to the account which concerns the collective nature of the protest. So let's assume for the sake of argument that we have a protest where the, all the protesters goal is to bring about a, just, a, a, a necessary change of public policy, a justified change of public policy, and to express anger or defiance at the state that mistreats them. Okay, And let's assume for the sake of argument that these are just goals. Okay, So this is the type of protest we're interested in. One of problem or one, uh, one, one thing we, we immediately notice is that the protesters are not acting in isolation. Okay, they share these goals and they are aware that they, are that they share these goals. So put differently, they are acting together. And what acting together precisely means is, as everybody in this room knows, open to debate. For the purposes of discussion here, we can use one definition, um, one by Christopher Kutz's model of collective actions, although nothing here hinges on this. We can use other models as well. According to Kutz, people who act together at the minimum intend to do their part in a collective act, which means that they're doing a task that uh, they're doing the task that they ought to perform in order to for the uh, uh, realization of the collective goal or shared goal to be successful. So applied to the case of the protesters, we can say that those who take part in the protest are described. So they clash with the police, they spray graffiti, they take part in the burning of a police station, they smash window shops. They're all doing their part. Okay, They're not just isolated individuals who happen to do these things next to each other. They're a crowd with a roughly defined set, shared set of goals uh, who, act, uh, who perform certain actions in order to realize uh, uh, these goals. Now, the fact that the protesters are such a group and not a mere collection of unrelated individuals uh, raises an important challenge for the necessity test. And this challenge is pointed out by Seth Lazar in his article on necessity. As he explains, we can distinguish between individual and collective necessity. So the actions that meet a necessity constraint at the individual level, where individuals act independently, may be different from the set of actions that meet the necessity test at the collective level, when people act in or concert as a group. So just a clear example that uh, Sest gives in his article. So multiple threats, one, A, B, and C each face unjustified threat from um, X, Y, and Z. And acting alone, A, B, and C can uh, each avert the threat to their life only by killing X, Y, and Z, respectively. Okay. So in this case, each of the three attackers can save her life only by killing her specific attacker. Uh, each of the three defenders, sorry, can save her life only by killing her specific attacker. So the lethal harm that each inflict, and by extension, the aggregated harm, that is three killings, meets the necessity test. But let's now consider a different scenario, multiple threats too, where D, E, and F, again, are threatened respectively by X, Y, and Z, but D, E, F are now a group agent. By this, I mean that they can communicate with each other, they can decide on a plan, and they can execute it by playing different roles. And acting together in this way, they can actually all avert the threats um, the, that they face by, sub, by subduing their attackers and inflicting on them a non-fatal harm. So in this case, D and F face similar threat to A, B, and C, threat to their lives, but acting as a group, they can inflict much less defensive harm on their attackers. Um, so as long as we have here cases of very similar threats, we can see that there are two very different um, uh, morally weighted outcomes that uh, would meet the necessity test in each of these scenarios. Okay, so what does this observation tell us about the case of violent protests? So as we saw, the protesters are acting together, so they share certain goals. And I think it's entirely plausible to assume that the goals could be achieved to a sufficient degree without each protesters having to engage in the same level of violent action. So for example, I think it's not necessary for each and every protesters to spray offensive graffiti on the walls of public buildings so that the message of defiance can be communicated. It's not necessary that each protesters will burn down a police station to communicate the demand for a policy change. It's not necessary for each protesters to block a subway station to draw the attention of the media. At some point, the violence will have, been, will have served its purpose, the message will have been uh, delivered, and the violence will have become unnecessary. Now, if the protesters were a highly coordinated group like uh, Group Agent DEF, uh, 
with a clear plan of action and ability to execute it, um, it might have been easy for them as a group to identify the precise level of violence that is necessary for them to achieve their goals. In my, indeed, it might be the case, actually, that if they were organized in this way, they would not have needed to use the violence at all. And I, that, that relates to Ying's comments earlier. Um, and uh, even if they did need to use the violence, they would have um, a better assessment of what uh, collective necessity permits. So just to give an example that supports this hypothesis, consider the decision of the African National Congress in 1961 to desert nonviolent tactics in the struggle against apartheid. So this decision was taken centrally by the ANC after careful deliberation. Nelson Maidena describes in his area Rivona trial speech that, and this is a quote for him, the ANC uh, was prepared to depart from its 50 year old policy of nonviolence to the extent that it would no longer disapprove of probably controlled sabotage. So members who undertook such activity would not be subject to disciplinary action by the ANC. This is a clear example where the ANC is an extremely co coordinated group, clear decision-making procedures, authority structure. It decides about a policy of controlled violence. It states what control violence is, and then he has the tools to enforce that specific level on, uh, on its members. So it kind of gets collective necessity. Um, it, you know, it, it, it aims not to exceed collective necessity, or at least we can assume so. But the protesters we are concerned with are not such a group. They, the protest, the violent protesters that I'm interested in, like the ones I mentioned earlier in, the, in, the, in my introductory comments, are by definition an unstructured and unorganized body. They act spontaneously and sporadically. Uh, there are some levels of coordination between them, for example, through social media. And um, there is sometimes some level of pre-planning, uh, but there is no central decision-making or compliance assurance mechanisms. So what should conclusions should we draw for this type of collective violence when we meet a necessity challenge? There's an influential article by Stephanie Collins on a collective duties that addresses a, a similar question. So Collins discusses in that article, if you're familiar with it, the cases of collective rescue rather than collective violence. But I think the analysis is relevant for us here. She asks us to imagine a group of five beachgoers on a beach who suddenly notice a drowning bather. None of the bathers, uh, none of the beachgoers is a good enough swimmer to save that drowning man herself. Um, but, um, and the only way to save him is actually engaging in a fairly complex uh, co cooperation endeavor. So there, there's a boat there and three people are needed to operate together to, to get the boat running. And, and the two others uh, are needed to wait on the beach and to pull him out of the water and so on and so forth, okay? So in this situation, Collins tells us, we, it is wrong to argue that each uh, beachgoer has a direct duty to rescue the drowning men. To say that you have a duty to fine implies that you can fine without unreasonable cost to yourself, and none of the beachgoers can actually save the drowning man by herself. Nevertheless, it tells us it doesn't follow that each beachgoer has no duty to act. Rather than saving the drowning man herself, each has a duty to collectivize. That's what Collins calls it. A duty to respond to each other in a way that will allow them to form a group that will be able to save the drowning man. So drawing on Collins, perhaps we can conclude that similar logic applies to the case of defensive harm. In the same way that we have a duty to save others, especially at low personal cost to ourselves, we have a general or natural duty not to impose unnecessary defensive harm on others, if they, even if they attack us unjustifiably. If we ought to collectivize in order to be able to save others together as a group, we also ought to collectivize in order to be able to together inflict less defensive harm than we would do were we to act alone. Um, okay, but what does a duty to collectivize precisely entails? Um, so we have one example of a highly collectivized and disi disciplined political organization like the ANC, which was indeed able to successfully execute a political struggle campaign with fairly low levels of political violence. Um, is that the level of organization that we can expect from the group that I mentioned earlier? I think not. I think it would be wrong to argue that oppressed minorities necessarily have the duty to organize themselves into such an, or an organization. The ANC unique success to the side it is not implausible to argue that such levels of political organizations are not easily available to oppressed minorities, for example, to detainees and refugee detention centers and prisoners in high security prisons, or even to oppressed citizens who face a ra radical uh, social, economic, and political marginalizations. Such groups just might not be able to turn themselves into highly structured groups, either because they are directly prevented from doing so by the state authority, or because the scope of social and economic deprivation and exclusion that they face, face make it very hard for them to create the necessary trust and solidarity bonds 
for long-term political cooperation. As Collins tells us, duties of, uh, individuals have a duty to organize themselves into authoritative groups only if they can do so at reasonable expected moral and personal cost. And I think that in the cases, at least in some of the cases as described, it's hard to see how this condition is fulfilled. So should we conclude that the protesters have no duties of, of collectivization? This again seems to me like a too extreme answer. Because recall the nature of the group we are talking about. It is, it is some kind of a group. It shares some common goal, a goal where each is trying to do their task to, to perform uh, to, to, as perform, perform tasks to the successful realization of this shared goal. And as a matter of fact, if we look at our real-world protests of that nature, it, it is it is uh, it is undeniable that the commitment to the success of this collective endeavor does require some level of responsible and responsibility and some level of coordination between the protesters. And the fact that protesters are able to perform this trust attests that there are these levels of coordination and, and, and responsibility be between them. So what's the conclusion we can draw from this? I think that what follows is that protesters do have a duty to collectivize, but what it translates into is a duty to engage in such low levels of cooperation. And by this, I mean that they ought to do that not just because it serves a goal, but that these levels of cooperation coordination can assist them in discharging um, the duty not to impose unnecessary harm. Each protester may not be able to organize herself with others into a fully functional group, but each protester can keep an eye on what others are doing and on the progress on the protest and adjust her activities accordingly. So each protester can take into account the fact that acting collectively means that she herself does not necessarily need to engage in the same levels of violence that she would have had she acted alone. And um, so, um, so by this, I, live, I mean levels of responsiveness to the level of defensive harms that is imposed by other agents during the uh, protest. Moreover, each protester has a duty to try and coordinate with others during the protest rather than acting alone and to encourage such form of communication, responsiveness and coordination. And each protester has a duty to respond positively to such coordination efforts by others. That said, we can only expect these to be fairly minimal levels of coordination and at a local level, okay? And I want to emphasize that my suggestion does not assume that the protesters will agree about the required levels of harms or actually will be able to kind of reach a, an agreement about this in the course of a protest. Part of the definition of violent protest is the spontaneity and lack of organization. And if we drop that, we are no longer talking about the violent protests that we are concerned with. We cannot expect protesters to get coordinate in this kind of uh, highly formalized manner. What we can expect of them is to take into account the fact that they are acting in a group and that as a group, they are defending themselves with the injustices inflicted on them at the hands of the state. Acting in a group gives one more impact power, but also gives one the opportunity to inflict less harm on behalf of the goal that they defend. Uh, and um, where these opportunities are kind of readily available, they should grasp them. Now, I think one of the frustrating things about this conclusion that it doesn't give us a precise answer about the expected cooperation that protesters can ought to engage with, but I actually don't think that we can give such a precise answer. It all really depends on the circumstances at hand. All we can say at the general level that we can express protesters to grab on cooperation opportunities when they are available and encouraging others to do so uh, in to cooperate in this way. Um, I don't think this is an over demanding requirements, um, even during the chaos of um, the protests as we know them against state injustices. And I end with that. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for this. Thank all three of you. Uh, we move to Q and A. So uh, please use your virtual hands, raise your virtual hands and I'll manage a queue.